Social radicalism is a very broad and capacious term, and the danger is that it become quite vague. So, Richard, let me turn back to you and put to you an accusation that might be made about today's parliamentary left uh, in the Labour Party, which is that, yes, it's much more ostensibly leftist in its language, but in some ways, when you look at the detail of what, say, the top leadership are proposing, they keep talking about 1945 as a wonderful moment, but it's also sometimes a kind of economic conversation that hasn't necessarily moved on since 1945. In other words, talking about spending very large amounts on various public goods, but not necessarily looking for genuine radical change in terms of how the economy can serve the population. The language is there, but the policies don't always seem to be. Is that in any way a fair accusation? Well, I think that we've got to understand that we're on the back of neoliberal free market fundamentalist economics of the kind that Liz passionately advocates. Um, what we're coming in on the back of 40 years of that in this country. Well, I do since, think uh, we, 19, that's what we have had. Uh, since since, since uh, 1979. What the Labour Party manifesto in 2017 proposed really was moving towards really a kind of social democratic, democratic socialist, Scandinavian model. I think there's a better way possible where people and the public good are put first rather than just the pursuit of untrammeled profit. Some may call it radical, some may not call it radical. I certainly think... Well, Richard, of course, necessary. Scandinavia has currently got a Danish social democratic party that's trying to stop immigrants coming in. Sweden has one of the fastest moving far right movements. Is, is Scandinavia really a place that we want to aspire to? Well, I'm talking about the <coughs> division uh, historically between uh, public spending, uh, between uh, those at the top in terms of the economic 1% and 0.1% and the rest of the population, levels of inequality, levels of equality. Uh, when it comes to other things, of course, the far right is a threat across across Europe. And it's only through... But it's Scandinavian social democracy that's caused that. I mean, there is a linear link between what they did in the 80s and what's happening now. Of, of course, but I think that, to be fair, I think Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell and Dan Abbott are a bit more left-wing than the... Than the uh, average social democrat in some of these parties which are facing the problems which you quite rightly uh, analyse. Well, thanks for that. And if we're bringing back accusations of the past, Liz, is there an accusation that it's not 1945, but 1985, a year that some of us remember rather fondly for its music, at least, that is still in your mind? In other words, that free market libertarian vision, which was a central part of the intellectual legacy of Thatcherism, doesn't seem to have moved on in 30 well, the fact is that Britain's economy was in a dire situation in the 1970s and it was turned around by a series of supply-side reforms. And which North Sea oil money. Made our, and North Sea oil money. But what I would say now is we do face a different set of challenges, but we need to apply free market mechanisms to solve those challenges. So, for example, housing. You know, Richard talked about 1945. I think one of the worst legacies of that government was the Town and Country Planning Act, which essentially made huge swathes of our country impossible to build on. We're now in a situation you mean the where... Green belt, for well, the Green Belt in London. But we're now in a situation where people in London who are renting are paying 50% of their income in rent. If you look at a city like Tokyo, that has much freer panic planning policies, the rents are much lower, people can afford to live in that city. So that, to me is a protectionist top-down planning policy. It isn't a free market policy that's... Uh, but, uh, do you see what I mean? If we had a freer policy, if we allowed building around stations in our green belt, which would be much more environmentally friendly than putting those houses in the countryside because people would be able to commute into work, we could build a million homes for young people in our greatest city. You so, know, that, so that, to me, is a radical solution to a social and economic problem, which is giving people more power over their own lives. And I think the Labour Party aren't willing to take those kind of steps. Well, we'll get back to the Labour Party in a minute, but... In Tokyo, fact, they introduced you, the you, act you in the first you place. You mentioned Tokyo. Tokyo is one of the least green cities in the world. It was also, of course, flattened by Allied bombers during the, most of the Second World War, which gave more of a kind of tabula rasa to, to build on. Well, I could Would highlight you know? Germany as another country with extremely good planning policies. They have a zoning system. Again, houses are more affordable in Germany and home ownership rates are rising much faster in Germany. You know, we have an incredibly bureaucratic system that takes ages and the houses aren't being built. So okay. I think we should learn from those other countries. Okay, so we'll come back to some of those messages, but I want to get to, 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 to Vince Cable. We've mentioned, in fact, Richard mentioned the word social democratic. I don't know if to a liberal democrat remembering the words SDP from the old days brings about a, uh, a happy frisson or perhaps a slightly nervous one. But 
there is a reality that what might have been considered centrist politics, uh, and that was always a term that suggested a kind of safe, comfortable middle, now seems to have been heavily discredited. People want radicalism, and if there's one thing that centrism isn't, it's that. Well, to the extent that people do want radical differences, they tend to be the populist right rather than the left, I would suspect. But uh, I just don't accept that the what, what I call the social liberal model, which is a mixture of social democracy and liberal values, that that's in any way discredited or failed. I mean, you, you well, they keep can, losing you, well, elections, Vince. Is that let, a discreditation? No, not at all. Let, let, let me just take the model that we started discussing a minute ago which is the Scandinavian countries, or you could take Canada. I mean, there, there are quite a few countries in the world which have a sensible, good mixture of things, right? They're, they're free enterprise economies, by and large. They're open to trade in, in the Scandinavian countries to the European Union. Um, they, they perform above average economically. They also pay quite a lot of attention to the redistribution of income and wealth, which is right. They have a healthy welfare state. Now, sure, like all other economies, they've come under a certain amount of stress, and you have some extreme right-wing movements, but, but so what? I mean, you know, the, the Swedes have a, a party that gets 10, 15% of the votes on anti-immigrant prejudice. It's rather higher than that in the last election, though. It we, we, we do, as we do in this country. As we do in this country. Let's not get f uh, completely freaked out by the fact that there is a, a kind of extreme right anti-immigrant movement. I mean, it's there, we've got to deal with it. But it doesn't invalidate the kind of society that they have created and we should be trying to strengthen here, which is, you know, good values, getting, getting the private sector working, letting markets operate where it's appropriate, but having a proper attention to fairness, to environment, and, and so on. If it's getting that balance right that is critical, and lurching off to ideological extremes is not, I think, in, in any way helpful. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.